publishers. So uh, just so over the past couple of years doing content marketing and a variety of other things, I've learned a ton about this. So I'm so thrilled to be able to share something I'm really passionate about uh, with you guys today. And also just working with a whole variety of different publishers. Um, I've gotten to see like a lot of cool data about what works and what doesn't work. So I'm going to get a little bit metrics driven for you, but nothing uh, too heady. So I'm really thrilled to uh, share all of this stuff with you today. Like I said, I'm Janet, and I'm working over at Shareaholic. Uh, before this, I was working at HubSpot doing content creation and social media lead generation. And I came there via another startup, 140. We got acquired, and that was a social media marketing startup. So um, I've been doing this for a couple years now, and um, I'm just so excited to be at Shareaholic. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity. Uh, we have kind of a cool story. We started over in 2008, and we actually started just with the uh, Firefox extension, and um, it was a nice and weekend project with my CEO, and you can meet him over in the other room there at the SNS Lounge, but we uh, started as a nice and weekend project with the Firefox extension, and in just a little bit over a year, it grew to over a million downloads, and so we had huge traction in the beginning, and uh, it's really exciting to see that we're like a 10-person company now. So now if you uh, fast forward to 2012, we're at two, over 2 million down, downloads for our browser extension. And um, now we have our content sharing and discovery tools, and we're on a little bit more than 200,000 websites, including uh, locally we're on the Patriots website and uh, our startup friends over at Wayfair. So that's really exciting for me. And in addition to that, we have an API, and we have more than 2,500 developers uh, creating their own content sharing tools and extensions through our API. So it's exciting to see that we're also powering other people's projects. With a combination of all of these different tools, we reach uh, 270 million people each month with unique monthly visitors. And that's pretty significant if you really think about it. Um, you know, for context, that's more than the countries of Germany, France, and the United Kingdom combined. So I always like to put it this way. If Shareaholic was a nation, we'd be the fourth largest country in the world. And uh, probably a pretty fun place to live. But I always think it's kind of funny that I would be like running marketing for like a vlogging startup because I kind of think that I was like a vlogging late bloomer or I had humble beginnings. I got to social media and vlogging through um, an intro to digital media class at took my senior year of college. And I've been a server for a really long time, so it's age 16 all through college. So I just had tons of funny stories to tell about like my batch of crazy customers. And so that was the content for my blog. I just wrote about customers and um, probably like boys as well. Um, but I got an A on the project. So if I can start from like humble beginning and have sort of this like silly blog out there and then do it for a living, trust me, uh, anybody can do this. Because really, like even though blogging has been around for quite a long time, I guess if you think about back to like the live journal days and stuff, I still think that like a lot of people are really figuring this out. I think that. I mean, I think so many awesome and smart people, even just here today, that they don't entirely know what to write about, and then they don't know how to measure what they write about. And even the people that are measuring, all they really measure are page views. But there are like so many other metrics and things that you're doing as part of you know, your own blogging, whether you're a hobby blogger, or if you're a content marketer and you're trying to generate leads. There's so many other little things that you're doing that you should measure that all contribute to that main metric of page views. So, um, I think that one of those biggest things is social shares because I see it all the time with you know our publishers that those who are getting most shares obviously are the highest traffic websites. And social sharing uh, is really important to measure and um, optimize for as well because um, our data shows that 27% of the traffic is from referral traffic, and that means that you know social media traffic that's people clicking through on your links from Facebook or Twitter and. The way you're going to get those links out there is through people sharing your content. So it's really important to sort of think about this as part of your content strategy. So um, kind of what today's presentation is all about is sort of if I was going to do a content overhaul, if I was going to take a step back and really think about how I wanted to redo my blog and optimize for social sharing, uh, this is you know, these are the steps that I would take. So I think the first thing you need to go to when you take a step back would be to look at your analytics. Um, at ShareHub, we try to drink our own champagne and we look at our own analytics dashboard, obviously. And uh, so we kind of look at you know what content is getting shared the most, uh, what is getting the most page views, and where is it getting shared to. Because it helps us understand how we're going to promote our content 
and it helps us understand the con you know, types of topics that are actually resonating with our audience. And so those are things you want to sort of look for in your analytics. If you're using Google Analytics, you can look for a report similar to this under you know, uh, top content and then look at the individual pages. So now that you know, you've explored the data jungle and you sort of see what is the most popular content out there, you want to actually uh, put this into some sort of a plan. And I think that it's really important to always post with a plan. I see a ton of people that just sort of post uh, flippantly or, you know, even um, companies, they just sort of, oh, okay, I think I should vlog today. And then they just go and post like pictures of a company party. I think that if you really want to focus on a new content strategy and optimizing for social sharing, you need to actually set out a plan and, uh, you know, try something specific and then go back and see if it worked or not. And if it did it, set out another plan and try another thing that was specific and, you know, go from there. So your tool that you really want to use in order to set out that content plan is an editorial calendar, which that's not scary or anything. Basically that just means that you're going to say, okay, I'm going to try you know, this kind of content these days um, throughout the next month or so. Um, we try to plan our content out about two weeks in advance. Um, and we use just a Google Doc actually for this. And I've talked to even some bloggers for pretty big organizations, you know, companies that could afford anything. but and Google Docs just, they rock for this. Um, the nice thing about Google Docs, like it's free, it's also shareable, so if you're working with different people within your organization, um, you can, you know, just share the document. If you're working with people um, outside of your organization, you can just share the document, you know, freelancers, anybody. And also it's really easy to keep yourself organized with what you're trying to approach with each, each piece of content. So the things that we like to think about is, you know, as part of our marketing, um, we have different buyer personas that we are uh, targeting with each piece of content. We have a different call to action. Um, sometimes we like to just collect some notes, so, you know, links for research and stuff. We put that in there as well. Um, I talk a little bit more in depth about this. Um, it's sort of an editorial calendar 101 uh, blog post that I did that um, pretty, it resonated pretty well with people. And um, I put a bit of link for that on here. So now that you are, you know, all set, you know what's been working for you in the past, and you're ready to plan that out into an editorial calendar, um, I want to recommend some different kinds of shareable content that I've seen work really well for other publishers and also is kind of successful. So really, um, the reason that I'm blogging is because I'm a marketer, and so everything I, I try to approach from that, you know, pretty sound marketing background, and a common PR uh, tactic that you can do in order to get coverage is to sort of insert yourself in a current news story, so if people are already going to be, you know, people are talking about the Olympics right now, thinking about how you can insert your own angle into uh, that kind of story. So in the case for us, it would be, you know, looking at, who is talking about the Olympics the most on social media or on blogs. You know, that's how it would work for a blog like ours. Whereas like, if you were a fitness blog, maybe it would be 10 fitness tips from Olympic athletes. So, I don't know if you see what I'm saying, that you take the thing that you're an expert with and you connect that to something that somebody's already talking about. Um, so it's like a common thing in PR that you would pitch yourself as like, an expert in that, you know, current events topic. You can do the same thing with your blog content. You can just create your own content and insert yourself as an expert or as a unique angle to that current topic of conversation. And next um, to this post, you know what I mean? Like five tips for blank or five cool new blank. Uh, those, they really work. Um, there's a reason people do them all the time and it's because they are successful. I think that people kind of like hate to love with posts because they can get a little hokey sometimes. Like, you know, we see them all the time, but they work for a reason. And, um, you know, first of all, the thing about a list post is that people like to scan. They don't really like to read in, in general. Uh, and so when you have a list post, things are just broken down in a very digestible manner. And um, another thing about a list post is that you know that you're going to get a tangible benefit right out of that post and that's communicated right from the headline. You know that you're going to learn five tips for this or you're going to see five cool new tools for this. So I would say that, you know, list posts, 
people hate to love them because they think it look or come to it that, oh, you can actually boil down some big strategy or some big thing into just like five little tips, but I would recommend trying them out. Another thing I would recommend is, you know, blog often. Um, our most successful publishers are getting those pages and everything. It's kind of a no-brainer, those are also the ones that are posting the most. Um, so I would say uh, three times a week is a good start. Uh, we now at the, are at the point where it's with a combination of public different employees writing the blog and uh, also some guest bloggers that we're able to get out content every day of the week. Um, so I would say this is definitely a case where more is more. In addition, if you're going to be trying with a new approach to content and you're really going to be optimizing for shareability, you, know, you can't really do that if you're only you know, throwing your hat in the ring once a month. So I would encourage you to really try to focus on this and create a lot of content. But that's like really scary, right? Like you have so many other things to do other than uh, you know content creation. And it can get a little overwhelming about you know how am I going to actually get this content written. I've tried a couple of different things that um, have worked with varying uh, degrees of success with different companies. So um, my personal favorite way to get this content written is by guest bloggers because there are people in your community who are really, really smart about the topics that you're trying to create content about. And I have found that engaging those people and highlighting them, shining the light on them, and letting them communicate that in your blog, um, they're always like really excited to do it. And another thing is that with a guest blogger, they have their own following, and they're really excited to blog for you, and so they're going to share their content all over the place because they're excited to guest blog. And you know, also they have their own little family who's going to come and say like, oh hey, you know, can a guest blog? I'm excited to you know, share their content. So it's a pretty successful strategy. I would say the cons of guest blogging is that sometimes people are coming in and doing it, you know, for their own purposes and they're going to try and be self-promotional. So you just have to communicate expectations really clearly from the get-go of uh, what's okay to link to and how many mentions of someone's company or blog is okay. Um, the other thing is that people have their own jobs and their own blogs that they need to write for. So the thing is that, you know, it's kind of hit or miss, you know, sometimes people can only do this once a month for you or, you know, once a quarter because people are busy. It's just the reality of it. And so you need to uh, kind of fill the funnel of guest bloggers, if you will, if you're really going to focus on this as a way to get your content written. And then also freelancers are another thing that I've worked with um, a lot. It really depends. Um, freelancers, it can be pretty affordable, it can be pretty uh, steep, depending on, you know, people's level of expertise. I would say that it's nice to work with a freelancer because you can really work with the right person to get exactly the kind of content that you want. The other thing I would say to watch out for, though, is that they are coming, you know, from the outside in. So if you're, you're you know, getting this content written about your company, they're not necessarily going to know all the nuances and the timeliness of your product and, you know, have the exact right angles to take. But what you can do, like, early in the relationship with a freelancer is identify what the strength is and identify the kinds of posts that they're really good at and just focus on them creating those, that kind of content and then use that to the rest. So that's been, you know, the most successful way to get the most out of a freelancer for me. And then finally, interns. Interns can, you know, go either way. It can be something who's really inexperienced and uh, you have to start a your hand to teach them. But then you also can find a diamond in the rock who is, you know, someone who's eager to learn and someone who um, can create amazing content. I would say that, you know, in all fairness, a lot of times, you know, I graduated from a PR program that was, you know, writing heavy, like I said, I took a digital media class, but a lot of times, you know, writing pieces of papers and stuff, that's a whole lot different than vlogging. And so, uh, you know, just try and take that into consideration. But like I said, you can find somebody who's very eager to learn and create that content for your blog. So um, now that we've talked about, like, you know, how to get that content created and, um, you know, how to maybe use the help of a freelancer or a guest blogger or an intern to do that, uh, I want you to think about, you know, how to get the shareable format into your blog post. So this is um, a little infographic from FBO Mods. Uh, they're an FBO company out in uh, Seattle, and I absolutely love their blog. I learn so much from them all the time. And I really like this outline of a perfectly optimized blog post. 
um, so that it basically means that they're targeting the right keywords, the same keywords throughout the page title, which is the headline, and then also the image uh, file name, and then throughout the body of the post. And um, not even just like from an SEO standpoint, you know, that's making it fun to read for Google, but I think this is making it fun to read for humans as well, just because it's a predictable format, and it's nice and clean, and it'll, you know, just make all of your posts really uniform, and easy for your readers to read, and the further you can get them to read your article and get all the value from it, the more likely they are to get. So your headline, that's, you know, how you begin your article. And headlines are very, very important. It's your first discussion, and it's what people see when, you know, it's your content shared throughout social media. So you need to make it snappy, and you need to also target the right keywords. So that's not always the easiest thing to do, but it's worth really putting some thought into uh, what your headline is going to be. And also realize that Google takes into account social signals, like your click-through rate on uh, social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, even Google News. So really get good at uh, writing great headlines. And look at the headlines that you want to share, that you plug on, you know, think about what made you, you know, what caught your attention about that headline. There are a couple of elements to great headlines that I always try to think about. Um, first of all, like, express that sense of urgency. There's, there's so much content out there nowadays that it's like, well, why should I read this post? Um, so for instance, even that, you know, here are five tools for blogging that you should try out right now. Like that's a phrase, you know what I mean, that sort of expresses, expresses that sense of urgency. Also usefulness. Again, going back to list posts, it, it shows you what you're going to get out of that content. It shows you the benefit that you're going to learn, and I think that that's another reason why they're pretty successful. And then be specific. I think, you know, anything too vague or too lyrical, um, usually it, it doesn't work as well than, you know, showing people specifically what they're going to learn from your content. The thing I like to remind people is that you can write sort of a funnier, like snappier headline that's funny for humans, but then you can also change your page title to target keywords so that it's, you know, more friendly for SEO and for Google because Google doesn't laugh. So um, I think this is a really good example from the Wall Street Journal where um, in an article they have this funny snappy little headline, video still the radios are, but then if you look at it closely on that page title, it's just a much more literal, uh, blatant, explanation of what the content is about. And so you're seeing here that they change the page title, and then that's what the Google search results looks like. And so uh, that's one thing you want to think about optimizing for in your blog content. So you really want to start your blog post in a way that catches the reader's attention. And um, you want to make it short so that you can get to the meat of your article. Um, you know, your tips or your bullets or your story that you're telling. These are a few of my favorite ways to begin a blog article. Uh, first, state a problem. Again, it's, a, you know, showing that sense of urgency, like why are we talking about what we're talking about today? Um, sometimes I like to make a, like a little fun, like play, a popular phrase or like even a song lyric or like something. It, it's a fun way to like catch a reader's attention and sort of make them chuckle and uh, get them involved in your content early on. And one of my really favorite ways to start a blog post is by offering a metric, you know, cite a recent study, and, um, you know, it helps to convey, you know, what a trend is or what a problem is, or, you know, it really will shock people and um, make them see why they need to learn what you're presenting to them. And I've also found that people love to share a metric in uh, their social share. So, like, because that's a pretty tangible learning and a takeaway, so sometimes people won't just, like, share your headline, they'll just this type of metric that you put in your introduction. So it's a good way to hook a reader's attention. Um, something I recommend, you know, throughout the copy of your post is to have a predictable voice. So this is, again, why you should blog often, because you'll become a better writer and you can develop that voice. Um, so this is one of my favorite blogs, Nerd Fitness, and the guy who writes it, he just has like such a funny and um, really enthusiastic voice. He uses like a ton of bold text and capital letters and exclamation points, like he's a huge dork, 
And, um, and you know, it's just like so fun to read this post. Now, that's not the right voice for every blog, but it's not meant to be. It's right for his audience and his blog. And I think that because you can tell um, that his voice, you feel like he's speaking to you. So it builds that rapport with your readers. And um, it keeps them engaged that content. And it definitely makes it more shareable. Another thing I strongly recommend um, throughout the body of your post is to think about how you can make it uh, optimized for Pinterest. Um, Pinterest is like all the rage nowadays, but honestly, it's with good reason. I think that the data speaks for itself. Um, we do monthly reports based on the referral traffic trends for our publishers. And last month, we found that Pinterest referral traffic actually exceeded traffic from Google referrals, Bing, uh, Twitter, and StumbleUpon. So this pretty huge. I think it's something we should all pay attention to. If it's right for every single uh, blog, you know, you have to look at, you know, your own content and your own metrics and decide for yourself. But I think if you are thinking about uh, optimizing for Pinterest, then I, what, something I really like that um, some of our publishers do is they'll brand their visuals. Um, this is a health and fitness blogger. And uh, you can see here that she is actually putting the name of her blog and her URL on the uh, sort of Pinterest image. And so I think that that um, not only is driving that referral traffic to her website, when people are going to click through on that from Pinterest, but she's also spreading that brand awareness. I've also seen bloggers who are working on different branded campaigns. Um, like I know that there's a ton of uh, bloggers in our network there, fitness bloggers working on a GMT campaign right now, and they're actually putting the hashtag um, right on the image. And so again, they're spreading that awareness about the campaign that they're working on. Finally, uh, as far as like you know, the actual body of your content, uh, another thing to think about is that you need to engage those uh, new readers that are coming to your website because they might not be love at first sight. They might not see that first post from you that they really want to share, and so you need to kind of keep them coming back for more. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. First, I think a blog that does this really well is the How About Me blog. They're an online dating site, and they just a really funny blog all about dating. And um, something that they do is they always like refer people to this old post that was you know, related to what they're talking about. And I've talked to people who write this blog, and they are very, like, strategic about tracking their evergreen content, that content that is performing well for them, you know, months and months after, you know, they first published it. And so they make sure to link to that throughout their post. Um, in a way that you can do that that's less manual, if you can use a related content widget, uh, we use the Shareaholic uh, widget on our blog, and uh, what the theme widgets do is they actually take into account uh, you know, recommendations, or they take into account page views, and social shares, and uh, different signals. And so our blog um, has this, this is an example of another blogger using it as well. So the reality is that in order to be shared, you have to share your content yourself. Um, promoting your content is just about as important as creating that content in the first place yourself. And there are a few little like, technical nuances you want to pay attention to in order to um, you know, make your content really terrible. So first you need to like, look at the anatomy of a Facebook share. And um, this also goes for LinkedIn and uh, Google Plus, very similar. So you see here that the featured image is set and um, it makes it really visually appealing. And then also the page title is um, snappy, but it also optimizes the keywords we're trying to target for. And then the meta description is able to include those keywords, but it's also readable for humans, which is important. And so you want to make sure that all of these things are set so that when people do share your content to uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Google+, like those shares are very similar to this, um, you want to make sure that it looks clean. You know what I mean? Twitter is a beast all on its own because of that 140 character description or restriction, and then there's also, you know, having shortened links, and a lot of um, sharing tools, is you have to go in and actually add your own Twitter account, which I highly encourage you to do, because there's a lot of people that make awesome content, but they, uh, they don't optimize for like, these little areas, and it just makes the social share look kind of funky, and I have a very strong feeling that people, if they were something sort of pop up like this, you're like, oh, I don't want to share that. They act out of it. Like, you just miss that traffic opportunity. So uh, what you do want your Twitter share
your code look like is, you know, have your page title clean, have your own Twitter account put into the social share. And you can do that in the um, admin panel for your sharing plugin. Um, I know we point to exactly where you need to do that for share all of your Um, last, I wanted to go through a couple of other plugins that you can look at and in order to make all this happen in a more efficient way. Um, it's sort of surprising, I think, because as like someone who works for a WordPress plugin, I'm not really a plugin junkie. I like to keep it simple, and I just only like to use what I actually think is important. Not too many bells and whistles on my blog. So the first one I recommend is that uh, WP Touch. Now, WP Touch, what that does is it makes a mobile version of your website. Um, our most recent data shows that between June 2011 and June of this year, mobile traffic grew 120% overall. Um, people are reading your blog on you know, their iPhones or their iPads or whatever phone they are using. So it's a good idea to make sure that your website looks clean on mobile. Um, in addition to that, we offer some mobile sharing buttons that are optimized for that, and they're really fun to use for research. Um, so it's something you want to think about. I know I mentioned the featured image thing a couple of times when talking about you know, Google Plus Share or Facebook Share. There's a plugin called the Auto Featured Image plugin that'll set these for you um, in a very simple way. And then also, I was talking about the Google uh, Doc for an editorial calendar. There's a pretty cool editorial calendar plugin. It's a little bit more repository. It's just an editorial calendar plugin. And why I like that is because if you have multiple writers for your blog, it's really easy to um, have people really drag and drop their face. So if the post is scheduled for Friday, and then you're like, no, actually, we need it for Wednesday, all you have to do is like drag and drop it in this fun calendar interface. And I really like that because um, as opposed to having to like, unschedule things, reschedule them, and you know, you never know, you might make a mistake and accidentally hit publish. Not that I've done that before on um, any important news, but um, you know, it's just a fun interface to use. It's a very useful plugin. And then finally, the all in one SEO cast. So I mentioned a couple of times, you know, changing your page title versus having maybe a different headline or adding a really good meta description that includes your keywords you're targeting for. I think the all-in-one SEO pack makes it dead simple to do this, and um, it kind of helps me, you know, stay in my good practices because it's always there for me, right? It's the last, uh, but not least, I would say when you're thinking about optimizing your uh, content for shareability, try to, like, scratch your own itch. Um, think about, like, why do you share the content that you share? And what is the content that you're always seeing shared in your new page on Facebook and in your Twitter space? You know, why do you share what you share? What is actually being shared by people that you follow? You know, why did Pony 2012 uh, go viral? And another one that I saw obviously that got shared everywhere was the, um, I forget exactly the publication that it was published in, but the um, Why Women Can't Have It All article. I'm sure we all saw that. So, like, what were these elements of uh, these articles and the like, videos and content? Like, why did that get shared so much? And why did you share it possibly? Um, so try to think about that first, you know, yourself as a content consumer and, you know, put those elements of what you've learned into your, your job as a content creator. And um, I'll take any questions if you would like. Anyone have questions? <laughs>
maybe like the initial rush from people who weren't confused it before, but like maybe like a rush from marketers and stuff, I'll rush to it um, for the media coverage, but then it can sort of wore off for a little bit too. But now it's coming back up, and so I think that it, you know, had that kind of spike because of the media coverage, but prior to that it had been growing organically just by being a product that was really sticky and people loved. And so I think it's going back to that sort of growth that, you know, now that people might not be writing about it quite as much and things like that, um, it's going back to organic growth. So I do believe in it. And like the fact that it's like mostly women on there, I mean, if I had a startup that it was mostly like women and stuff, I would be thrilled. Like women buy a lot of stuff. So like, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I can say that. Yeah. Go ahead. So I have a question. Um, have you guys seen, you know, is there, can you put too many social sharing buttons on one page? Like, you know, you can have a floating sidebar, you can have a uh, social sharing button across the top, and the bottom of the post. Like, it's too much, too much that you guys tested and made that stuff out. I, you know, I don't have, honestly, like, any um, data to back this up, but I have heard, like, anecdotally, even, like, from you know, people I was speaking with today, that, like, too much can be a little too much. It can be a little aggressive. Um, and if you have like a ton of different um, plugins on there, um, you could just like sort of slow down your site and everything. So I think that like you have to make some decisions, like don't put too much stuff on there. Um, but then again, like I said before, I think I'm just a plugin. So, uh, no, I don't have any data, unfortunately, back up. Go ahead. What I find frustrating is that people, well, I think it can be good or not good, People will push certain types of content out to certain platforms. Like in other words, people might do events or things that are of the moment on Twitter. They might talk to their, I don't know, their board members on Facebook and put different content on, you know, what well, I'm trying to think of Pinterest. So what's hard though is that for an end user, and I don't know how to negotiate this if I were to make a website, like I end up trying to follow people on multiple platforms because some people are just pushing out the same stuff on multiple platforms and some people are really, which I think is probably the better thing, figuring out who's listening to them on what platform and then putting out targeted information for their audience. And I just want to know what your thoughts were about that, whether you suggest people pushing out the same stuff to multiple platforms or varying it by platform. I really, I mean, it takes a lot of effort, but I love when companies vary the content uh, per platform. Like, I really admire actually ModCloth. They're um, an online real estate retail for clothing, and they, um, and they're awesome at social. Like, their Tumblr is, it's not just like reposts from Twitter. They take, um, they curate outfits from Polygore, and then they take those images, and they'll like add it to their Tumblr, and so it's like the ModCloth, you know, designer uh, tips of the day or something. They're just like fun to follow on Tumblr. But then again, like their Twitter stream is more, I think, like support kind of focused. And then their Facebook is just different as well. So I love that multi-channel approach. But then again, I see why other people are, you know, a little bit um, more, you know, they just like spread and spread, I think. I think it's a time issue for people. But I think it's more effective to be different and just love them. Go ahead. I agree, my clock is one of those views that I follow because they really vary it up. Yeah, that was it. They now bring like another one in AU, which is a great yeah. uh, clothing company. Um, my question has to do with RSS feeds and how do you integrate your blog with an RSS feed and your Twitter and your Facebook? Or do you still use that and does it help with your numbers and your following? And just talk a little bit about that. Um, we offer it, like you can just subscribe by RSS from us, but we don't have it connected to any of our social media platforms. So um, I guess like what our persona board is like on the Facebook page is um, we do share our content on the Facebook page, but we found that we get um, significantly more click through when we just do like a big photo and then put the um, shortened link in the caption. Like I checked this out in April, I think the number was 56% more click when we did that with the photo and the smaller link. And then you wouldn't get that with an RSS feed. It would just always be a feed of the link, and I think their click through rate would suffer, and you wouldn't get as much traffic to the Facebook page. And then um, for Twitter, what we try to do is um, 
we identify what the most popular posts have been that week, and then also we like to share some evergreen content a little bit, and um, we schedule posts like throughout the weekend and you know throughout the week as well. We always tweet our posts um, at least twice um, because you know it's come for different time zones and things like that. So. It, it is, you know, it is like more tedious, but like I said, it, it, we do get more of a click through rate when we do that. So, so you find that in the end, the hand tailored approach is more effective? Yeah, I kind of feel like if you're going to do social media, like you have to jump all in, you do have to commit to it like that. That's my take. Go ahead. She brought it up. So, what days and times are the best to post stuff? You know, is it like the three o'clock lull when people, you know, sort of like power down and they're nine to five and they might start to go on the internet when they're at work and not supposed to be? Yeah. Like what days and times work best and what which days are the most? I mean, I think it really depends on um, your blog and um, depends on your time zone and everything, but what we found, we ran this data, um, I believe it was in January for our websites, and it's a significant data set. It's, we have 200,000 websites that uh, reach 170 million viewers. Uh, and we found that, you know, definitely the weekdays and 9 a.m. Uh, was the, you know, ideal time. Uh, not much, like, as far as shares and page views on Fridays, like, from that data set. Um, but the same time, I will say, like, to counter that for our blog, like, what we try to do is we try to target very specific content more towards the beginning of the week. I feel like the beginning of the week that the people have their game face on, so like our data posts do better, like when we're doing that. But then on Friday when we do like the funny posts, um, just to just sort of engage the community and make something fun for them. Like yesterday we did, uh, you know, what your favorite font says about you. Yeah, so like posts like that, and those definitely do better like Fridays, Thursdays, um, when people are like more receptive to that. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, I know that we're running out of time here. I also have lots of share hall stickers up here, so you can put them on your laptops or uh, friends. Um, Great so presentation. Great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you.